started raining outside. So these are kind of times of biblical challenges for all of us and around in the area. And now there is a cyclone. Uh, so again, I hope the internet works at my end as well, Julia, in the next uh, hour or so. So these are very interesting times for all of us. And, uh, you know, this is a very interesting topic because gap year is something that many of us in the counseling community have heard of. Some of us have experience working with students, but it is far from the norm here in India, right? So I, you know, I thought that this would be a very apt topic given the current uh, situation in the world and in higher ed and particularly for our graduating class. So the first thing that I would like to do is perhaps just pause and maybe do a quick poll of the participants who have come so that uh, Julia and I get a sense for who you are and where you're coming from. So the question is very simple. Are you an educator, a parent, a student or other? I will launch it and maybe we will just give it 20 seconds. Thank you so much. Super. Thank you, everybody. So, uh, here are the results. I think uh, half of you of half of the audience today is counselor as it stands at the moment, and then the other half is parents and students and others. And I suspect these are high school uh, seniors or the graduating batch right now. Um, so those are the results, right? As as we are talking to everybody, Julia, I think that that's a good insight for you, at least as yeah. it stands right now. Mm -hmm. um, let me jump back to the presentation. So that's the first thing that I wanted to do. The second thing that I wanted to do is just remind everybody that we are recording the session today um, and it will be available on the YouTube channel. And number two is if you have questions, please, please feel free to post them in the, in the Q&A and the chat box. And we will get to a Q&A session, uh, uh, session at the end of our presentation today. So we won't be stopping for questions, but please feel free to post them. We will definitely respond to them at the end of the presentation. So now that I've got those housekeeping issues out of the way, the first thing I thought that I should share with you some very interesting insights. So you might have noticed that uh, at, during the, the registration for this seminar, we asked you some interesting questions. So, um, and I wanted to present the insights from uh, how you all responded. So number one was, you know, for the counselors who have joined us, how many of you have a student who is considering doing a gap year right now? And 55% of the counselors said, yes, we have a student who is considering taking gap year right now. 35% said that they were not sure uh, that they would have to explore, but maybe there might be a student. And only 10% of, uh, of the counselors said that we do not have a, a, a student who's considering gap year. So that's insight number one. Insight number two is that, you know, uh, we asked you what's stopping more students from taking gap semesters or gap years at the moment. The number one response that we had was fear of missing out, right? So FOMO, everyone's heard of it. So the kids are uh, parents, I think parents are more worried than kids maybe about, uh, you know, them missing out on life or missing out on opportunities or getting out of sync somehow. Number two is lack of knowledge uh, or lack of understanding of a gap year. And I'm, I'm kind of half happy that that was the case because that makes the relevance of what we are doing today uh, um, high. And you know, I think this can be a great educational opportunity for everybody present that how can we structure gap years better? Number three was our concern around readjusting back into college and getting back into uh, the groove of things after taking a gap from uh, the normal routine of education. And number four, and only a very small minority of the cases was permission to differ from college. Now, I think historically that has never been a challenge, but perhaps in the current situation, you know, colleges are being slightly more restrictive in allowing students to take gap years or gap semesters. So, so for those of you who are students out there, 
uh, please definitely check the college policies and how they might be changing in the months or weeks or months to come around taking gap years. So having said that, um, I also, you know, did uh, another workshop with certain parents uh, about a week or 10 days ago. And I would say that one out of three parents that I surveyed was open to the idea of their children taking a gap year. And this, this was a group of parents who are parents of graduating class, right? So, and I was quite uh, pleasantly surprised that the number could be that high because this is something that in India we have never really spoken too much about, right? So, um, I thought that, you know, we should talk about that, the gap year and India because, hell, if I was 17 and given an opportunity to do a gap year, I would jump on it without skipping a beat, but uh, that is traditionally not the case in India. We, we very much love going from school uh, from from class to class and finishing school and going to college and college to job etc you know although life is never like that but uh, there is always this fear that we will miss out on or we will somehow not do well in life if we take time out but uh, all the conventional wisdom of the world tells you that taking time out is a good thing i mean we are the country that gave the world meditation i thought you know that is kind of like taking a gap from life and just reflecting and uh, and thinking about what you're doing, where you're going. Uh, gap year is sort of, for me, like meditation from education and finding purpose. And India has always been that country that was a great gap year destination. You know, I, uh, I used to teach undergraduates during my graduate school. I used to teach uh, undergraduates at Cambridge University. And that was the first time in my life I met so many undergraduates who had taken gap years. And many of them had come to India. You know, India is always this classic destination for British and European and Israeli kids uh, to come and spend a year and travel and see the Taj Mahal and go, you know, go to Goa, Kerala, the mountains, uh, go to along the Ganga, you know, from all the way from, uh, from the mountains all the way to Calcutta. So India has been a great destination for gap year students from the West. At the same time, I find that, you know, uh, our students here are not so open and our parents are definitely not as open to the idea of gap year. And perhaps COVID-19 might be a slightly a game changer in that direction. And it might force us to pause and think about whether gap year is really the right uh, opportunity to pursue next instead of going to college. So having said that, um, I also wanted to put this picture up because, you know, uh, and this is, you know, my experience that the gap year was more common with the European and the British students that I saw in my life as compared to the American and the Canadian. Uh, of course, Julia will talk uh, to us more about that in a moment. But uh, I think the real highlight in the United States was when Malia Obama decided to take a gap year, uh, you know, before joining Harvard. And Harvard is, again, one of those colleges that always tell students, go take a gap year before you come here. So uh, she, she made good on that offer. And I think that hit the media and I think a lot of Americans uh, took notice of that, that idea of taking a gap year, or at least that's my opinion sitting here in India. Uh, and please correct me, Julia, if I'm wrong later. So that, 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 yeah, I just wanted to put that up, you know, that it's, it's only, you know, for all, many of us when celebrity kids do something, we always love to follow it. So I just wanted to remind everybody, you know, if the, the, the ex-president's daughter can do it and it's good enough for her, maybe it's good enough for some of our kids. Right. So, so, so having said that, I, I want to uh, uh, introduce Julia. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out and battling internet challenges today. Uh, Julia is, yes, uh, Julia is uh, a graduate of Hamilton College, uh, a college I love. It's a bijou of an institution in upstate New York. It's a gorgeous college. Um, several of my ex-students have gone to Hamilton, so it's a college I've gotten to know. Uh, from both sides of the table. 2008, I think, is when she began consulting uh, and she established uh, on route consulting. And uh, she's since then worked with hundreds and thousands of students uh, and mentored them in how to take structured gap years. So clearly uh, a great opportunity for all of us to listen from the expert. Julia is also the president of the board of directors of the Gap Year Association. Uh, which is a very large association in the U.S. of, uh, of uh, sort of uh, 
community of organizations that support gap year students and provide opportunities to gap year students. And this is something that, uh, you know, I saw uh, at conferences when I visited the US, the, the gap year association, or I think it had a different name previously, but now it's the GYA. Um, so welcome, and we would love to hear your thoughts. Um, before we jump into that, I thought, you know, of playing today's presentation presentation in an interesting manner. I thought both sides of the table can learn from each other. So what I'm going to do today, Julia, is I'm going to uh, poll the audience and you'll see their insights so you understand their perspectives. And then maybe we can come to you and hear your perspective. So I think uh, that could be fun for both of us today. I love that. It's experiential, which is a hallmark of the gap year experience. So that's perfect. <laughs> Super. So let me stop the presentation there and put the second polling question up. Um, which is that what is the biggest benefit of taking a gap year? So this is a question for you, my audience. What is the biggest benefit of taking a gap year? I'm launching it and let's give it maybe 30 to 45 seconds. Looking forward to what you have to say. Okay, thank you everybody. I'm ending the poll now and sharing the results with everyone to see. So what is the biggest benefit of taking a gap year? Almost 40% of you said personal maturity and self-discovery. 30% said academic and career exploration. 18% said worldly exposure. 6% said admission into a better college, so maybe sneaking one past. And 6% said other. So, so there you have it, Julia. Right. So well, let me stop sharing that. So would love to hear your thoughts on how you think gap years benefit students. Yeah, well, I think that the, the you know, the participants had good insight. Um, you didn't have an all of the above, which I think would have been interesting because, well, I think that aside from admission into a better college, which is not something that we tend to see, although I would say that taking a gap year can make you a more attractive candidate just if you do interesting things and can articulate that on your application if, you, if you're reapplying. But it's not really the reason that we see American students taking gap time. But I think that all the other ones are, are you know, definitely true. And I think that one, the benefits that you get out of a gap year have to do with your motivations for taking gap time. So we do see in, in, um, in surveys from uh, past gap year students that 98% of them say that their gap year helped increase their maturity and, and sense of themselves. So I think that that's in line with how most of your folks see gap time. And then as far as academic and career exploration, that is a big motivator for students to take gap time especially, you know, I'm going to be, you know, speaking mostly from the American student perspective, but we don't have a lot of opportunities for young people in the States to explore their potential career paths. And I think that a gap year allows uh, and provides for different opportunities and pathways for that exploration to occur. So we actually see 60% of, of gap year students saying that their gap year helped lead them towards their career path or choice of college major. So that's really um, some striking statistics on that end too. And not to mention that 88% of gap year students say that they're more employable thanks to their gap year. And that's as, as a result of gap year experiences as well as the soft skills that they're gaining on their gap time. Interesting, you know, for me, it's, the world is becoming more chaotic, right? And it certainly seems that way right now. And it's becoming more competitive, and yet there are interesting opportunities, but college is becoming more expensive, right? Every year. And I, I can see that a lot of families and Parents more than students are thinking that 
maybe it's a good idea to take a short gap, really reflect on what you want to do, figure out what you want to do, and then pursue that academic opportunity and be sure, you know, rather than go to college and spend all this money and then maybe not be able to utilize your education or, or having to use only a partial amount of it in a transferable manner, in another career. So, I mean, for me, and particularly as a counselor based here in India, and I think that, you know, it can be very beneficial for students, not just to discover themselves as an individual and a person, but from the perspective of studying abroad and making sure that you have a higher return on investment because college is expensive and you better have a, a, a stronger sense of what you're doing rather than walk blindly into it, right? You hit the nail on the head with that. That's how I frame it a lot of the times. If we're talking about the financial um, benefits of gap time, um, you know, the gap year students graduate statistically sooner than traditional students um, when we're talking about at American universities. And then also, we also see higher GPAs on average with gap year students. So it's not, there's um, the correlation there. We don't know exactly why that is, but we think that it's just another year to mature and, and more direction in career path that then creates a more motivated um, and intentional student once they get to college. So it, it does, definitely makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think intentional is the key word rather than exploratory, right? Because so many right. students go to college in an exploratory, wandering state of mind. And this right. time out of the regular education setting gives them uh, space to breathe and figure things out and then go after specific opportunities, right? Or at least that would be the ideal gap year student for me, I think. Maybe sure. not every student. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, when you were talking about the history of gap years, it's interesting because... Um, if we think about, if we think back to world cultures and even indigenous cultures, there is often a formal rite of passage that, you know, has, has existed all over the world, you know, whether it's a walkabout or um, vision quest or all these like very ancient concepts of going out when you are in this stage of emerging adulthood, going out into the world, discovering who you are, emerging as kind of the fully formed version of yourself. Um, and I think that we, uh, in modern times, have lost that in a lot of places, and including the states. And um, college used to be seen as that rite of passage, and now it's a very expensive rite of passage. So I think that we are trying to create this bridge year for students where they can have that freedom to explore, freedom to experiment, freedom to fail, um, and not have the same financial implications as when they're actually in a more expensive college environment. Yeah, and I see the more sort of let me use the word enlightened colleges, really encourage students in taking gap years, right? So I, I have seen Harvard and Princeton, uh, Duke, Tufts offer bridge year programs, right? And it's interesting they say bridge rather than gap because, you know, it's the mindset. Right. Um, right. So it's, it's, they have structured programs that they offer to students. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's fabulous that, I mean, so some of those institutions have just um, formal policies to encourage gap time. So for instance, Harvard um, has, they, they just kind of say, we encourage gap years. And if you propose a deferral plan that makes sense, we will approve it very easily. So they have kind of a policy standpoint. And then whereas Tufts and Princeton and some of these other colleges have bridge programs where they're actually contracting with gap year program providers, um, to create a more structured experience for their incoming students. And that's also, I mean, a great way to kind of um, have, a, have a shared experience with future classmates. So that's a, that's a cool way of doing it. And then Duke and UNC Chapel Hill and some other institutions have gap year granting programs. And those are scholarship programs where they'll fund your gap year or, or partially fund your gap year um, and then provide some mentoring and other resources to help um, with the planning and execution of it. So every institution is, or, you know, everyone has their own policy, everyone has their own way of doing it, but it's all in service of creating more uh, opportunities for students to have these, these gap years. Great. Let's yeah. shift gears. Let's talk about the next thing. So maybe you could talk about it from an American perspective. You know, what are the kind of opportunities a typical American student would pursue in the gap year? Sure. Um, there's so many different opportunities. And uh, that's what I, I think that's one of my favorite aspects of gap time is that it's, I, I always uh, describe it as the most custom, customizable form of education that you could ever hope to receive. So, you know, a gap year really is not apart from the educational, you know, pedagogy. It's just experiential in, in type. 
So when you're thinking about a gap year, again, it's not this void that you fall into where you're just sitting on the couch watching Netflix. It's it's this time to get out of yourself and into the world. And so the opportunities that support this kind of learning um, look very varied depending on the student's interest. So typical things that I see are service work, so volunteering either in the States or abroad, interning and career exploration opportunities, uh, courses, and that can be usually those are enrichment courses. So a student may want to learn how to rock climb or may want to spend time painting or some of these more hobby related opportunities, but sometimes they're also certifications. So sometimes students will get a certification in coding or something else that they can that is a contributing towards their college pathway, but not necessarily for college credit. Um, and then we also see kind of more formalized gap year programs that are more of the service learning type where a student is a part of a cohort of peers and they're usually traveling um, as a group with leaders that are there acting as kind of guides both in the mentorship capacity as well as the logistics capacity. And so they're moving through a region usually um, and doing some adventure travel, doing some service work and doing a lot of just intercultural exploration. And that's really the, the goal of those programs is to help a student uh, experience a different culture in a more structured capacity so they're really able to process it and get the maximum benefit out of reflection and um, experiencing it with other people. So those are just a few of the categories of programs and then within that are just um, a lot of a lot of diversity as far as what a student can focus on. Yeah, I'm sure given the amount of experience you have, you must have seen an entire smattering of things that kids have done. What yeah, have been some of the most interesting uh, or different opportunities you've seen them pursue? Oh, wow. Well, I think that, you know, so it depends on the student's level of um, kind of entrepreneurial spirit sometimes or, or independence as far as how, um, how they'll self-design their year. So some students go a, a pretty, I would say like the traditional gap year route would be to do something more structured like a service learning program, followed by either service work or internships and things that kind of help prepare them in different ways. So those are more traditional things. And then things that are a little bit off the beaten path that I've seen students do. Um, there was an American student, not one of my students, but an American who a couple of years ago rode across the Atlantic unassisted. Uh, so he actually had a like a a rowboat and was uh, rowing. Um, so that was really impressive. Um, some students have started um, small companies or built built companies that they were. Uh, Julia, I'm sorry to pause you there for a moment. We we lost you there. We couldn't hear you for a moment. Yes, I think we can hear you. Yeah. Good. I tried to use my my fancy microphone, but sometimes it it just decides to to not cooperate. What was the last thing that I said that before it cut off? I think the last thing I heard was the the kid who went rowing across the Atlantic. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, so we had the rower. We've had students hike the Appalachian Trail, which is kind of, a, which takes about, it's a three month long journey here in the States to, to really, to hike it end to end. And it goes down the East Coast or up the East Coast, depending on the direction that you go. Um, we've had students do projects where they're actually working in the United States national parks and doing trail work and trail building. Um, we've had students uh, go abroad and um, learn about um, different industries and uh, different, do, you know, a lot of, um, let's see, I had a student who worked in a hospital in Cape Town, South Africa, shadowing doctors. I had a student um, who, go, who went to Australia to do um, relief work after the Australia wildlife fire or wildfires in Australia. Um, students who've gotten their, their scuba certification in Thailand while doing uh, restoration, uh, environmental restoration and helping rebuild reefs that have been damaged and bleached. Um, and then obviously there's just a million things to do in India as well. So there's just, um, there's so many things out there. So I always say, tell people that it's important to attach your gap time to some tangible goals to help kind of bring the world into a smaller focus for a particular student. Great. And when we say gap year, it's not exactly a year, right? Because it's a summer and a year and then another summer and then maybe you go to college. So, uh, it's, I mean, there, it's not exactly a 12 month thing. I think it's more like an 18 month thing, right? Yeah. And, and 
that's a really great point because most students do multiple things over the course of their gap time. I see it, we see a lot of American students earning money for those summers. So they start, you know, they graduate high school, they try to work a summer job, and then they usually go, they fledge away from home in the fall. And then typically they're home for our holiday season and New Year's, and then they go off again in January for another few things, and then they're home again for the summer. That is a typical arc that we see in the States. So there's a component of of earning some money to put towards your gap time. And then there's um, a component where you're typically away from home and doing that learning or service work or whatever you're doing, and then kind of a re-entry process. Mm -hmm. Great, super. Let's, let's shift gears. Um, and I, so I thought that, you know, maybe we could also talk a little bit about how colleges view gap years, you know? Mm -hmm. um, if, if I was in admissions, and I'm looking at an applicant who's taken gap time, you know, um, how would I see that person differently from other students? Or, you know, do colleges encourage students to take gap years? I know we mentioned a couple of colleges, but maybe you could expand on that a little bit, on both of those sure. questions. Yeah. Sure, and what we typically see in the States is Americans who are, or who are bound for four-year colleges, uh, typically the best practice is to apply, you know, your last year of high school, and then defer your admission from your top school of choice. So we, we usually see a gap year wrapped into a college experience. So that you know what college you're going to, you've asked that institution for a formal deferral to hold your spot for a year, and then you go off and do your gap year activities. So that, that's a nice, neat little package when that can happen because it creates the expectation in the student's mind that college happens right after your gap time and there's a safety net of like the knowledge of what's happening next. So that I think uh, mentally is, makes it easier for students and parents to understand that there's, this is all part of the, the agreement as, as far as like what happens after the gap time. Um, for students uh, I, who I see who haven't applied to college yet and want to create or, or reapplying and want to create you know, a more attractive um, package for the, uh, for the colleges to consider, they want to try and do some interesting things at the front end of their gap time so that by the time they're applying in the you know, fall and winter, they have something to talk about. So if you're hoping to create a more you know, uh, interesting essay or something like that, um, you wanna try and do some of those things in the, those summer months and fall months that you can talk about in those personal statements. But what I hear from colleges, especially more uh, elite and competitive institutions is that no gap year experience, unless it's really extraordinary, is going to, over, like, is going to make up for test scores or GPAs that are not up to par. So you can, you can kind of separate yourself from the pack by taking a gap year and framing it in the right way, but you're not gonna become, like you're not gonna get into a school that you don't qualify for, if that makes sense. Absolutely, I think colleges have their priorities and I, I mean, academics is usually on the top. So, right. uh, yeah. um, you know, we're talking about gap year, um, but how frequently do you see students taking just a gap semester? Like Babson College is coming to my mind right now because they offer this January gap start. So do you see a lot of students just taking that, that one semester or half a year off instead of taking the whole year and two summers? Yeah, we do. But, um, and sometimes it's a little bit hard to predict because you don't typically ask for that after you've gotten admission. You kind of check the box as you're applying to college to be considered for January or February admission. And then they, they let you know if that's the case for you. So it's a little bit different from, from gap time, from a gap year, because you ask for a gap year deferral, but colleges typically don't let you just ask for a gap semester deferral. Although that may be different this year because of the complexity that we're facing with how to bring people back onto campus. So, um, so usually what happens is you're offered a January or February admission slot and you can choose to accept it or not accept it. Um, and I actually was a Jan admit to Hamilton, so I got to have a Jan admit experience. And I studied abroad in London my first semester freshman year with the other Hamilton students and Middlebury students. And I had a fantastic experience. It was like study abroad on, you know, for my first semester. So it was really cool for me as someone who was predisposed to wanting a gap year. Interesting. Super. Yeah. Let's, let's shift gears again. And let's do another poll. All right, and continuing with our theme of experiential learning about it. <laughs> so uh, let me stop my presentation and launch the next poll. The third question is, what is the biggest challenge you have faced when talking about a gap year? So particularly parents and counselors over here, 
you know, what is the biggest challenge we have faced when talking or thinking about gap year? All right, so here goes. And let's give it about another 30 to 45 seconds. Or maybe a minute because there are more options here. Okay, last 10 seconds and then I will close the poll. All right, thank you everybody. So here are the results, very interesting results. What is the biggest challenge you have faced when take, talking about a gap year? Number one is that we have a weak culture of taking gap years here in India. So no past students to present as role models, right? You don't. That's that, that Malia Obama factor that I was talking about. Right, that, right. Um, that's number one and 41% of the audience said that this is the problem that we face. The second most common answer was lack of knowledge about it and a lack of knowledge about gap year opportunities, right? So I think that seminar today is very apt when it comes to that one. 22% uh, of the people said that. 16% of the people said FOMO, fear of missing out. Oh my God, you know, how can I take a break? I, I cannot, you know, miss out on, on the game here. 11% said other. 5% um, said higher costs in the gap year. So of course it's an additional cost, right? On top of college. And then another 5% said ensuring academic continuity. So uh, I think I'm going to leave this up on the screen, Julia, and maybe sure. we can pick at each one of them. Maybe you can talk about each one of them. You know, and we can we can address them in the order of percentages. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. Well, I think these are all. I mean, these are all really legitimate concerns that people have. Um, and I think that that those the top two, the kind of weak culture and lack of knowledge, go hand in hand. And that's something that we still face in the states too. It's um, you know what we see in bigger cities or on the coast is more knowledge about the gap year, more people doing it, and that kind of has a self fulfilling prophecy as time moves on because upper uh, lower class or underclassmen see upperclassmen who have taken gap years come back to school, talk about it, um, feel, and so students feel more comfortable with the concept, and also they don't feel othered. Um, by the idea of taking a gap year because they're even here in the states where we're seeing, you know, a higher percentage of students taking a gap year, there's still a stigma um, in certain communities that, oh, why is that kid taking a gap year? Is it, uh, is, you know, do they not get into college or, you know, other, depending on the community, there's different stigmas, <laughs> but there is still that kind of feeling that there's, that going straight to college is the right path and that deviating from that path means that something is wrong. Um, but in schools and communities where a gap year is more widely accepted, the, the conception is completely flipped. And it's seen as, you know, if you saw someone in the grocery store who took, that you know took a gap year, you'd say, oh, Sarah, what did you do with your gap year? That sounds really cool. So um, it really varies place to place. And I assume that as the gap year grows in popularity in India, it would be the same, where certain communities where it's popular, you know, it would be seen in a positive light because it's pretty cool. And I think that once people get on board with it, um, you know, it's, it's kind of seen for what it is. Um, fear of missing out and feeling older than your peers is another concern that I hear mostly from students. Um, and it's one of those things where it's a top concern when you're 18 or 19 and graduating and feeling that pressure to go straight into college. And then on the other side of a gap year, I'll always ask my students, hey, you know, you were really concerned back when you graduated about being older than your peers now that you're starting college, like how do you feel now after your gap time? And they universally tell me, I would never trade my gap year for being like going on time. So I think that that is one of those concerns that, that kind of fizzles away uh, as the gap year progresses. And then once you get to college, you, you see other people around that have 
you know, maybe they took a postgrad year and they're starting at 19 or 20 years old. Or as you move through college, people defer time or, or take time off for different reasons. And so by the time you graduate, people are all different ages. So I think that not taking it, that's not a good reason to not take a gap year because it ends up not being kind of a non-issue as time progresses. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the, um, let's see, higher costs, I think that that's a, also a legitimate concern, um, especially here in the States, you know, families are really concerned about the cost of higher education. I assume that, you know, if you're an Indian family who's making the decision to send your child abroad to get their education, that's a big investment. And so you definitely wanna make sure that a gap year fits into that equation. And I think that one of the great things that we see um, are really affordable gap year opportunities and more and more scholarships and financial aid available for gap year students. So if you wanna even stay in India on your gap year, that's great because there are, there, you, it's a playground. The country is so amazing and diverse and there are places that you can explore and, and vol very low cost or free volunteer opportunities all over the country that you can engage in that won't cost the family much at all, especially if you're comparing it to a US-based college education, it's, it's negligible practically. Um, and then if you do wanna do you know, a, a internationally based formal gap year program that's a little bit more expensive, there are you know, scholarships and things like that available, especially because um, gap year programs love diversity and they want people represented from different countries. So that can make you a more competitive scholarship applicant too. Um, and then last one I think was just um, continuing in academics, which is again, you, you know, you don't want, I think there is a fear that a, that a gap year or not going straight to college could throw you off course. Um, and I think that that's not really what we're seeing um, in play out in practice. You know, if a student has, um, you know, a spot at a university, they almost always, and I mean nine times out of 10, according to our um, data, go straight to college after their gap year. They matriculate within a year um, and kind of, and they, they tend to do better once they get there. Um, and that for that one out of 10, that's maybe not starting college right away. My theory is that there's a pretty good reason for that. That could be an American who's maybe not supposed to be bound for a four-year school. Maybe they're more appropriate for a different type of higher education or perhaps there's other factors that are making it a, probably a good choice that they're not going straight to school. Super, that was such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for that. <laughs> My pleasure. So is there, do you see differences, you know, that things that kids worry more about than their parents? Or are there topics where you see parents more wor worried about it than kids, you know, across the table? I'm sure, I mean, we have the, on all issues at all times, but mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. You know, what are the things that parents worry more about? Yeah, well, aside from the ones that we already chose, because I'll, you know, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but I think that safety is one of the top concerns that parents are concerned about, kids not as much, you know. Um, and that, you know, that's definitely something to to think about when you're planning the gap year is, you know, what what is the family's risk tolerance, you know, and like what are what are the locations and types of experiences that are comfortable for that family. And I, I always encourage people to push that comfort zone a little bit and, and allow that young person to explore maybe a, in, in a way that makes everyone a little bit uncomfortable because that's what um, you know tends to make someone grow. But you also want to put it in a container that's appropriate for that learner. So that might be a more structured program or that could be some, some place where you have a family member that they can live with so that there's some sort of oversight and things like that. So I would say that Safety is a big concern for, for families. And then um, student concern, again, it's more of that FOMO and the feeling older and stuff like that. That's mostly what I see from students that tends to kind of um, fizzle away as time moves on. Super. And I, I suspect that's going to be the case in India as well. Now, since our audience is primarily counselors, could you maybe, if you could speak about it from a counselor's perspective, and is there something a counselor or a high school guidance counselor might need to worry about? with a gap year kid differently from any other high school student? I would say that it's there, you know, there, the profiles can be really different. I think that from a counselor perspective, one of the things you just want to think about is how to identify good candidates for a gap year early in their high school career or secondary school career so that they can, so that you can kind of introduce the idea sooner. Because if you talk about it their last year of school, then it's kind of a new concept and a lot of times they're a little bit like, ah, that's a, I don't know, I don't know if I want to like pivot that hard. But if you introduce the idea of deferring admission for a gap year as an intentional choice 
earlier, you know, um, then, then it becomes something that they noodle on, that they think about over the course of their schooling. They strategize about it. They think and dream about what they might want to do. And that allows them to start planning earlier and make it a better year and a more fulfilling year for them. So from a counselor perspective, I think that education, as much education as you feel compelled and, and able to provide as early as possible is a great way to kind of um, create just more, um, you know, acceptance of the idea, both in parents and students. So that's what I would, that's my biggest advice for counselors. Fantastic, really helpful, I think. Thank you so much for that. Okay, sure. let's shift gears again. Um, you know, one of the questions for me, right, and this is even pre-COVID-19, and I thought, how come more people don't take gap years, you know, and are you seeing more people turning uh, towards gap years, even in the pre-COVID-19 situation, and now definitely during COVID-19, so curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, um, so the American gap year, as we kind of think about it, started in earnest about 30 years ago. Um, but it really wasn't until Malia Obama, like you said, in 2016, where we started to see this like exponential rise in numbers and also just general knowledge. You know, I, when I started uh, en route consulting, you know, almost 12 years ago, I would go to a cocktail party and have to explain first what a gap year was, <laughs> then why it was something that happened, and then what a gap year counselor does. So I had to go through several levels of explanation before being able to describe what my career was. Um, and now I can tell people I work in the gap year industry or I'm a gap year coach and there's just so much more knowledge around it. So, um, so anecdotally, I think that um, we are seeing just a more widespread understanding of what a gap year is and what you can do with one. And then um, numbers wise, it's still a little hard to pinpoint the exact numbers in the states. We, we estimate that about 40,000 to 50,000 young people in the states take an intentional gap year after high school. And we are seeing growth in that number, but it's we're mostly tracking it through website traffic and attendance at gap year fairs and, and things like that. So it's really hard to know exactly how that number is growing, but we do see it growing. And I suppose there is faster growth in the high school where older kids have done the gap years, like you mentioned earlier, right? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Just at, for one case study, I, I work with a, a high school here in Vermont. And it's uh, when I first moved to Vermont, basically no one at that high school took gap time. And I um, developed a really great relationship with the school counselors there. I went in for presentations every year. I helped educate them about gap year options so they could work directly with their students. And now it's so common that they see about 10 to 15 to percent of their gap year of their graduating seniors taking a gap year every year. So I think that that's, that kind of speaks to that, you know, the school counselors are the, usually the first point of information for young people in this decision-making process. And if you present a gap year alongside these other valid post-secondary choices, then students really start embracing it earlier. So yeah, we definitely see that, that trend of students begetting students when it comes to gap time. Yep, and I think maybe in India, these are early days and we'll have to wait and watch yeah. if, you know, the similar thing happened here in India. Uh, any, yeah, exactly. any insights on, you know, what happened in China, if you work with any students from China or the rest of Asia? As far as what we're seeing with, like, gap year student numbers yeah. um, and being able to travel in, in China and things like that? No, uh, yeah, I think more international students uh, from Asia wanting mm -hmm. to take a gap year. Any insights on that? I know your work is US-centric, so uh, any yeah. comments about that? Well, actually, so I, I have a Google, I have a Google tracking, you know, for the, the search term gap year. And, um, and I actually, I think I see more, more um, articles posted in Indian newspapers about gap time than in Chinese uh, newspapers. So I think that it's, I think that there is some, you know, bubbling interest here in, you know, in India about it. And then in China, I think in certain pockets, I sometimes hear from IECs and other folks who who come to me and they say, you know, I think that a lot of Chinese students would benefit from gap time because, especially because um, when schooling is, is so intense, um, you know, that's where we see students kind of needing this, this break from formal academics. It's not a break from learning. It's not a break from growth. It's just a break from the formal classroom environment. And that can be, we, we know that that can be really beneficial for students' mental health, for their, um, just their, for their natural love of learning. Um, so that's something that I think we are starting to see in other countries as well, but I don't have statistics on it. Okay. Well, I yeah. was just fishing for something. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. 
All right, let's, uh, let's do the next poll. All right, so I'll stop sharing my screen. And the next question for the audience here is, what is the number one activity you would recommend to a gap year student here in India? All right, so fellow counselors, here is the, the poll coming your way, 30 seconds. What is the number one activity you would recommend to a gap year student here in India? Okay, I will be closing in 10 seconds. And thank you very much. So, here are the results. And nice. such an interesting result for me. Mm -hmm. um, number one, almost half the people said skill building. Right? 25%, mm 26% -hmm. uh, said community engagement. 21% said industry exposure, and then 3% uh, for travel and other. So any comments on this, Julia? Well, I think that it's it's so important. I think that that skills building is that's something that we don't always get out of the formal classroom. You know, you can learn so many things through the teacher-student memorizing kind of dynamic, but you have to learn critical thinking and problem solving and independence and interpersonal communication through different means sometimes. And so I think that that is one of the biggest benefits of gap time is really taking that student, putting them in a real world situation and saying, you know, go and go and figure it out. Um, <laughs> and I know that from I, I personally took a gap year after college and the skills that I gained um, on that experience. And I think that a lot of the skills that I gained, I was I spent almost a year in Tanzania doing public health outreach. And I was in a community where I had to learn Swahili and some of the local language. I had to, I had to just really, really push myself into integrating into a culture that wasn't, that wasn't my own and being, um, you know, learning all of those inter interpersonal and intercultural skills that I think um, make you a more competitive candidate in the global economy. Um, do I use Swahili day to day now? No, but I did have like such an important intellectual exercise in having to learn to communicate in a foreign language um, and in a different cultural setting. So that's just one example of how building out these skills um, in so many in, in a different setting have like they loop back to your professional career. So that one I think is is definitely important. Um, industry exposure is also, you know, that's a really popular one, I think. Um, I love seeing that community engagement is also kind of a top choice for people. Um, there's some really, really, really cool community-based organizations all over India that I send students to. Um, for instance, there, there's one in Damasala called Waste Warriors that works on how to recycle, how to compost, you know, things like that. There's um, sustainable development and intentional communities um, in certain areas that allow you to come and learn how to farm um, in sustainable ways. And that's not for people who necessarily want to go into farming as a career, but who, people who just want to kind of have a closer relationship to the land if they've grown up in a more urban setting. Um, you know, lots of education opportunities and outreach to students who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds. So, so many cool community engagement opportunities, both in your country and abroad. Um, and then, yeah, travel. Um, I think back to so many amazing movies. I think that part of our cultural imagination in America is like that, that going to India and, and like riding the trains and, and seeing all the sites and seeing the Himalayas all the way down to the beaches and obviously eating the food. Um, and I think that sometimes we dismiss travel as just like wandering without purpose. And I, it's so much more than that because I think that travel and skills building are actually things that go hand in hand. I know from my personal experience traveling in India with my husband, um, managing the trains uh, for the first time was a skills building exercise in <laughs> in all sorts of things in all sorts of ways you know having to communicate and advocate and think on our feet to find the right track and all those things that kind of come naturally when you live there <laughs> asante sana for that so that's great yeah. uh, we equally struggle with our trains so i think you're not <laughs> unique in that
<laughs> I could <Okay>. tell. <laughs> so let me close the poll there. And I think that was the last of my polls for the day. So I'm sad that we have finished it. Uh, let me jump back to the presentation. And any interesting suggestions from your side in COVID-19 settings, right? So people are worried about uh, social distancing and maybe not traveling, and, you know, taking care of uh, healthcare issues. And in the current environment, any tips and suggestions for, from you for future gap year students here in India? Sure, yeah, and I think that the, there are probably similar concerns as we're seeing in the States, and that's, you know, what is even going to be available this year in the context of COVID and how to stay safe and, and these kinds of things. And I think that a lot of that has to do with how we see the world and, and our own communities kind of opening up and or perhaps clamping down as the year moves on. Um, and I, this is one of the reasons why coronavirus is, is creating more talk about gap years is that you know, the, I think that it's, it's not a great, I mean, it's not a great way to start college virtually. And that's what's uh, the reality of the situation here in the States is a, a lot of colleges are either starting virtually or perhaps going to start in person with, the, with, you know, I think for an Indian student, like the nightmare scenarios, like get all the way over here, start college for a month and then get sent back home if colleges close again. So I think that one of the things I'm seeing with students this year is that choosing to take a gap year in the era of coronavirus allows you to take a little bit more power back into your situation and say like, okay, I'm going to defer my admission and think about how I can work on myself this year in depending on what's available. Um, and what's available will change and we have to kind of stay very, very flexible and open-minded to what that looks like. But what I'm seeing in the States and what I, um, what I can imagine happening in India as well is that a lot of students are staying domestic for the first part of their year for, until the end of the calendar year. Um, and so they're exploring things that are in more wilderness-based programs. So like knolls and other types of um, programs where you're more in, where you're in settings where there's fewer people. Um, we're seeing uh, cohort-based programs where the sizes are limited to you know, 10 or 12 students and there's protocols for isolation and, and self-isolation ahead of the program so that you kind of create some certainty around uh, you know, testing and things like that ahead of starting the program. So once you have your bubble of, of your cohort, you move in isolation kind of through the programming um, or place-based programs, meaning that you go, to a, you, know, you go to a setting that's probably a little bit, again, far removed out into the, into the rural areas and you do the program kind of in, again, in a little bit of a bubble. Um, that's not always practical. And so again, I think it depends on what you guys are seeing in your own communities as far as what might be a good way of, of um, you know, finding opportunities. But certainly there's so many great ways to, to, help your, to help in your own community. And that's what I'm encouraging a lot of young, uh, young Americans to do is how can you help COVID response in your own community? How can you you know, uh, learn more about the issues in your own community and, and use this time to give back. Um, and so that's a lot of students are joining virtual cohorts of gap year students so they can link in with other people, but also kind of working in their own community. So there's a, a local and virtual component to their gap time. So those are just some things that I'm seeing, but it's, it's I think it's one of those years where I have to stay very open minded. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're all looking for that answer at the moment. Um, right. <laughs> but definitely, this is a great time to uh, take part in the community and understand the, the roles and responsibilities that you have towards mm -hmm. others and the function of society. Um, I know that it's 7.24 here in India, and I think we've gone past a little bit. So this is my last question for the day. You know, if I'm a kid and uh, I'm finishing high school and I'm thinking, should I do this? You know, how would you uh, counsel me? And what are the kind of things that I should be asking myself and researching before I come to a conclusion that, yes, I think this is in my best interest? Right. Well, I think that of the, of, there's lots of different profiles of gap year student. Um, one student that I see a lot is a student who's worked extremely hard in high school and in secondary school and is a little bit burnt out by the time that they're ready to graduate and start college. And this is a conversation that's like very internal and, some, and that's something that you have to ask yourself. Do I feel burnt out as I graduate? And do I need a little bit of space before starting college so I can be more refreshed and ready for that, that really important experience? Um, so that's, you know, if that's, a, if that's part of the equation, that's a really good 
um, indicator that you should take a gap year. Um, if you've ever struggled with um, mental health or any kind of um, physical or emotional setbacks in your secondary school career, that would be another you know, indicator that some gap time where you're focusing on wellness and strategies to be to thrive in adulthood would be a really good choice. Um, students who are a little bit immature or a little bit lack, a little, lack life experience maybe would find themselves a little bit lost or floundering in college. Those are good students for a gap year. Um, students who don't know what they want to study and want to pursue some career exploration activities before committing to a major in college. Those are good candidates for a gap year. So as you can see, there's a lot of different and separate types of people who might decide to take gap time and they're gonna do different things with their gap time because they're, they're coming at it from a different perspective. Um, I would say that, you know, as far as starting your research, um, there's some, you know, great organizations like the Gap Year Association, which you already mentioned. And uh, there's an online platform called Go Overseas um, that has lots of different gap year programs that are kind of, that are peer reviewed, kind of like Yelp. Um, that you can look at. Um, and I, I host a podcast called Gap Year Radio and we profile uh, different gap year students experiences. That's another great place to hear student stories. So those are just a couple places where you can start your gap year journey. <laughs> That's great. I mean, it's such a heterogeneous population. Different people do this for different reasons and they end up doing a wide variety of things. Is there right. a kid out there that you would say, hey, you shouldn't be taking a gap year, right? You don't look like an ideal gap year kid. Yeah, that's such a good question too. And um, I would say that, so I, I have a sibling, I have a younger sister, and she's always my, my, my example of maybe someone who doesn't, doesn't need to take a gap year. She loves school and was like ready to just motor on right through. Um, and she's, you know, she's, always, she's done several post-grad, you know, work or post-grad degrees just because she loves academics and school so much. And so if you're the kind of student or if you're working with the kind of student who is just hyper motivated and very excited for the college experience and doesn't want to, you know, take a step, you know, aside to pursue other things at this moment, then maybe a gap year isn't the right choice after high school. But maybe if they're pursuing additional degrees, there could be time for a gap year later in life. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not for everybody, um, but that's, that's one of the only kind of types of people I see that maybe don't need a gap year. Um, and this year, I would say that the, it becomes a little bit more complicated with financial aid. So if you get a, if you are receiving a package from a, a college that is really great and it combines merit aid and scholarships and things like that, you may not want to roll the dice by, by deferring and having to reapply for that aid next year because we don't know exactly what the next couple of years are going to look like for American colleges. So that would be one situation this year that I would say to kind of maybe just go straight through. And then the other idea is that if you don't really mind the idea of starting college virtually or in this kind of hybrid setting that we're seeing and you don't mind that kind of uncertainty, um, you're just really excited to start college, then you know that's, that's something to consider as well. But I would say that most students don't consider gap year even though they should. And that's really, I think, where we're at this time where creating more knowledge around it is gonna benefit the students who maybe slip through the cracks of considering it that really should. Thanks, that was fantastic. And, and I mean, definitely, I can see the paradigm shift happening. You know, more and more people are starting to think about it and consider it. And probably that's the reason you're seeing that bubbling of gap year on Google from India. <laughs> yeah. So I think that brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. It was so fun interacting with you. And yeah. let me now wear a different hat uh, and try to read some of these questions and maybe we can discuss them one by one. Sure. So the first question is, uh, my intake was in September 2020 in a foreign university, but now I have to join their January 2021 intake. So will it be, still be called a gap year? Okay, so this is a student. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that this, uh, maybe the student needs to talk to the university rather than us answering this question. So I would encourage you to talk to the college. Uh, it's definitely not a, a gap year, it's a gap semester. And uh, I think you might want to consider some of the opportunities that Julia has presented to us today. All these experiences under, but I would say a gap year can be anywhere from a couple months to even a couple years. And that's, you know, we see that variety of people taking various amounts of time depending on what makes sense for them. So if you're taking a gap semester, you can still do all the things that we talked about, just it's a little bit shortened. Okay, next question. 
The concern is not so much about whether a gap year is an attractive option right now. It really, it's really the only option from where I see it. The concern is whether the college my child was to join this fall will extend the same offer, including the scholarship, to her for joining next year. And this is a parent here in India. So any, right. com any comments on that? Well, I have been reading about how a lot of American colleges are being more deferral friendly to international students this year because of comp potential complications with getting students into the country uh, this fall. So I would say that deferrals um, may be even easier to obtain than usual for international students. But that financial aid piece is the real question mark. So you have to talk to your future institution and walk through whether or not they can defer that package along with admission or whether or not you'll have to reapply next year. So that's kind of a case by case situation. Yeah, and it's, it's, you know, it's so varied across different colleges because every college has a different set of policies. So uh, I don't think there is, you know, uh, one silver bullet for answer for all the colleges. It's on a case by case basis at every college and you should look at your case, not necessarily just other admiss, admitted students. If you're looking at a scholarship package, uh, then I think you need to have that conversation with the college. Okay. Next question is, can you help me understand what does gap year program mean? I assume we can make our own program or a series of initiatives given our level of resources. This is a parent. Julia. Yeah. Really good question. So, um, so there, like I mentioned before, when we kind of went over the different types of gap year opportunities, some of them are packaged as a program that's run by an organization that you join. There's an admissions process. There's there's a lot of oversight in those programs, and that can be service learning, volunteering, interning courses. All of those things can be packaged as programs. Students can also self-design their year, and that often uh, looks a little different. That might be them starting a business. That might be getting an internship through a family connection. That might be, you know, helping out in their own community using resources that they research and find on their own using their own network. So there's no wrong way to build a gap year. The most important thing is that it's, it's this intentional period of time that's based on the students' goals and, and really empowering them to choose what they want out of their gap time. A lot of times, you know, uh, the right path is kind of chosen for them a lot of a lot of the time. So a gap year should really be a time where the, the family sets some parameters and boundaries and then you let that student kind of expand um, and choose what they want to do within those parameters. Thank you. The next question is with regard to reapplying to college in the gap year, the next set of applications start in October to December period. Since I've just graduated, how will I bring a substantial improvement to my application in only the next few months? So this is a, a student who's just graduated high school and is thinking of taking a gap year and is asking us what she should do differently in her application this time around. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you know, un unless you do something like really fabulous or noteworthy, um, it's not going to, it's not going to take your application from here to here. <laughs> it's going to, it'll be like this to this. So when you're, but the best way to, to reformat your application is to either um, do some certifications that might, that you might be able to add to your resume or do something experiential that's really interesting. Like um, I just recently read a story about this young woman who, who wrote her father to like across one of your provinces so that she could get him medical treatment for COVID. Um, like if you were to ride your bike across India for charity or something like that during your gap year and wrote about that in your essay, that would set you apart. So um, it doesn't have to be that extreme, but thinking creatively about how you can attach your personal story to a meaningful gap year experience and then articulate that in your personal statement or essay, that's one of the ways that you can use a gap year to your advantage. But it needs to be authentic, it needs to, be, it needs to come from you, and it can't be just, um, they'll see through anything that's not genuine. So you gotta be careful about that. <laughs> Thank you. And I've got a comment to add on top of that. You know, maybe there is another opportunity for you to consider additional testing, you know, if on the SAT or the ACT, if you thought, oh, my score was not that strong, maybe you can take it again. Maybe you can take your subject test again. Uh, you know, I know that many colleges are saying that they're test optional, but here is another data point that they can look at. You know, even in the COVID situations, you took the test and maybe you did better than in high school. So that's another thing. Yeah, maybe that's another thing to consider. 
right? Okay, and and do remember when you applied last year to college, that was on the basis of your grade 9, 10, 11, and early 12 scores. And now this time around, it will be with your entire high school transcript. So if you see a clear upward trend uh, and you have concrete numbers, I think that might help your application on the academic front as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And I think we have just enough time for one last question. Uh, oh my God, okay, <laughs> there are lots of questions coming in. Uh, in India, do you learn skill building Rather, where do you learn it? Won't industry exposure be a sort of skill building? Okay, uh, any, any comments on that? Yeah, I think that, you know, when we talk about skills, we can talk, we, we kind of mean maybe a couple different things. There could be skills that you add to a resume that, that could be related to, you know, a software certification or something that you, you build out as a skill that you can market yourself as, as a more, you know, um, in a certain industry. And then there's kind of these soft skills that just make you stand out when you interview or when you um, are in a workplace setting and things like that. So that would be those interpersonal communication, leadership, um, you know, confidence, all of those kind of softer skills that you gain on gap time can be obtained in a variety of different programming settings. So industry experience and internships are really good. I think that the, the most important uh, factor in thinking about what to do with your gap time is making sure that you have a mentor as part of it. And that's usually someone outside of your family, could be someone at an internship, but it could be also a program leader or someone else in your life who, who's there to kind of hold you accountable, but also be that person you bounce ideas off of and help process your year. The processing and reflection part of gap time is what helps those skills really come into their own. That's a great point. I think a mentor could really anchor you you know, and provide some stability as you go through the gap year. Now, I know, Julia, I said that was the last question, but two of them have come in, and I, I think they're very relevant. So if you don't mind, can I just take them? Mm, sure, yeah. yeah. I'm... So one student is asking us, how do I convince my parents to allow me to take a gap year? Mm, great question. Um, I wish I had had, you know, a seminar like this to, to workshop my ideas when I was a uh, senior in high school because I really wanted to gap year but I didn't have the, the, the evidence to provide to my parents to make, to make that argument. And I think that, you know, the, the Malia Obama Harvard equation, I think is pretty attractive to parents. So I think that when you, when you're presenting this idea to your parents, you may want to start with the fact that, that really great colleges in the States and around the world really like this choice because it produces more intentional college students and that people like Malia Obama and Yara Shahidi and other people in the States have done really well with their gap years. Um, and then you also, I think, if you just say you wanna take a gap year, that can scare a parent because they, again, they think of it as like falling into a big black hole, right? But if you say like, if you think about it ahead of time before you present the idea and say, I have some ideas, I think I'd like to get an internship or there's some volunteer work that I really am interested in. And I think I wanna do this combination of things on my gap year. Um, to help me be more prepared for college. If you come to your, your parents with that kind of proposal, then they're going to see that you're already thinking about it strategically, and that will probably help you. Fantastic. And I, I think that's where we'll close it today. Thank you so much, Julia. It was wonderful to be in conversation with you today. And I know that this is going to be such a helpful resource for school counselors and also parents and students. I hope to stay in touch. Yeah, it was such a pleasure. Can I give can I give one more like final tip of, of where people could maybe be able to build out their knowledge even more? Sure. Okay, cool. Well, it was it was so great to be here. And I just want to encourage, you know, the school counselors that are on the call or the students or parents, there are memberships for you ready to go at the Gap Year Association, which is gapyearassociation.org. Um, I'll I'll have us link to it later, um, maybe in the follow-up email, but um, there's counselor levels and um, student and parent levels. So if you really want some more education that's a little bit more in depth from where we've gone from here, I'd encourage you to, to join the association and uh, get more education that way. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to see you. Take care of yourself and let's keep in touch. Sounds good.